Welcome to the A to B project, man. How are you? It's just us two. Oh, I know. Guess what we're talking uh, about today? Hermities. Home remedies. <laughs> <laughs> I had to get that one out there. I don't know why I can't say home remedies. I really home struggled with that. Remedies, I nailed yeah. it that time. That's super. We'll, remedies. We'll, we'll dub that one over all the other ones that we'll stuff up <laughs> later on. Now these are these are remedies that obviously people have, have you know, that that are they're old wives' tales or they may not be. There may be some science, there may not be. There's teas, there's poultices, there's crystals on your knee, all sorts of so weird stuff. Talking about things that when you're at home and something goes wrong and there's all these things that we could try. Yeah. Typically things out of the cupboard that we hopefully happen to have. Hmm. Which Weird, not many people have a big herbal dispensary at home. So hopefully you do, because we're going to talk a few about herbs yeah. and weird little crystals yep. and clay clay, and soups. Lemons and honeys and all this sort of stuff. And and the beautiful thing is even chicken soup gets a big mention today. But but we're not talking about home remedies like paracetamol and codeine that you can get at home, you know, this sort of stuff. Yeah. You know, We're not talking about those remedies you get from the pharmacy. Yeah. These are home remedies. Yeah. Yeah. So some of them are great, some of them are poor, some of them have research, some of them don't, but they're all worthy of discussion. Let's do it. All right. What are we going to hit? What are we going to start with? Well, I want to start with a quick being winter, a common cold and flu. I mean, what do we do about that? I mean, we, we, we've woken up, we feel like shit. Yep. Pharmacies, you know, can't be bothered going there, don't want to get drugs. How do we treat this? And the, the classic one we have to talk about is lemon and honey. Oh, yeah. Let's do it. All right. So they found with honey, because I know if I've got a wound or something like that, or a leg ulcer or something, if I cover honey on it that honey is so high in sugar that it burns the skin like makes a hydrogen peroxide reaction mm-hmm. at the skin mm-hmm. that sterilizes everything and also that stimulates healing uh, so does it have the same thing in the throat it does it's antimicrobial in the throat because if you had a propolis you know those lollies yeah, that you get for yeah. the thing that that's what's in the honey that's antimicrobial honey doesn't go off yeah right. so it, it's got these anti-natural antimicrobial agents in it yep but it's also a natural anti-cough suppressant well hang on propolis is cool so propolis what it is is the um, the bees line the inside of the hive with propolis to actually stop the invading infections. It stops mm. fungus and mold getting into the hive, because once you, something's bathed in honey, it like I was saying, just sterilizes and cooks mm. it. You know, mm. like because mm. it's so high in the sugars. Yeah. But there's other stuff you're saying. Yeah, antimicrobial agents in honey, and there's anti-cough agents. Um, the the cool one about the cough, they they tested it against um, codeine, yeah. which is a classic. If you take 50 milligrams of codeine, that that's obviously a painkiller, but it also turns into morphine, which suppresses the the nervous cough reaction. Yeah, and it works as effectively as that in the study. Well, wow. so with for mums and that yeah. at home, you go to the chemist. They're the ones that your kid's got to be over six or something to access the codeine as a cough suppressant. Yeah. So for any of the children under six, they can try the honey, but not under 12. And 12 months, I mean. Yeah, no, so honey. So if you're under no. a year, you don't give your baby honey because of the potential for botulin, botulism. Botulism, yeah, yeah, because of the leaky gut they have naturally. So so the interesting thing about that is that, that that's a classic home remedy that, that works really well. Uh, and everyone's, t- well, not everyone, but a lot of people have honey at home. Yeah, well, while we're talking about it, one of my other favorite applications for honey for a home remedy, again, as long as they're not under that 12 months of mm. age, even though I put on the skin for eczema. So what I do with the honey and olive oil. Most people oh. have got that at home. Yeah. So I warm the olive oil enough, just just warm it before you get that smells coming off, but just enough to make it hotter. So when you tip the honey and you can stir it, and as it cools, keep stirring it so it doesn't separate. And that's my favourite eczema cream. Wow. So 50-50, olive oil and honey. Yeah. That's, that's, you've just, that's brilliant. Well, thank you, Steve. No, that's, it's, it's not on our list. I know, it's not. Quick, write that one down. It's beauty. No, bring it on. What's bring your next it, one? Bring it on. Look, while we're, we're, we're oh, on the what? honey, we're, we're yeah. keeping with the honey theme. I mean, this is this is a great medicine that we've talked about before about being antimicrobial and that sort of thing for all sorts of things. So let's say you've cut yourself. Okay. And the, ah, you've, I yeah, cut myself, yeah, Steve. You've, you've healed it up and it's, you know, yeah, you could go get antibiotics and all that sort of stuff, but you can put honey on wounds like I put honey on my wound here that is sticking there. Yeah. Just to kill the bugs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's the same as that ulcers and all that sort of stuff. So yeah. any big wound, you can whack it on. But you've got to really coat it. And a lot of people try to do too many things. They try to get products with honey in it. Yeah. But it's got to be like pure, huh? It's yeah, got to be like, because it, it's actually the the burning from the sugars and the, that sort of stuff, it's really important. Does it have to be medicated honey? No, it doesn't because if the high concentration of glucose and fructose in the honey causes osmosis, which pulls the water out of the microbes, which kills them, dehydrates yeah. them. Cool. But it's harmless for obviously putting on your skin, you know. So, yeah. so it's got that great, you know, non-toxic, like in the olden days um, when I was a kid, we used to use mercurochrome. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
mercury and chromium. You see, mercury man, on your skin. I was pretty much constantly covered. That could explain quite a few things. <laughs> <laughs> had a wicked colour. Like yeah. that, I remember that. It was like this wicked purpley colour. What was Condi's crystals? Oh, that's potassium permanganate, isn't it? Yeah. What would what does that do, Steve? <laughs> oh, it's, it, we, we used to. Oh, was a chemist. We used to make explosives out of it. We might have edited that bit out. But but yeah, it was used for an antimicrobial thing. You'd bathe in it and that sort yeah, of thing. Yeah, because we constantly had them at home. We had the, constantly with the Condi's crystals. Yeah. I used to put them into the chooks water. I had white ducks. Yeah. And I used to oh. put the Condi's crystals, and they turned purple. Yes. Was that killing them, Steve? <laughs> oh, probably was. Yeah, but let's not. <laughs> I used to put food colouring in. I used to do all this stuff to screw with the ducks, like turn them multi-colours. Really? Oh, yeah. Well, you know the flamingos, they're, they're yeah. actually coloured by the astaxanthin and yeah. the microbes. So, so you, you're the not... the carotenoid complexes. Yeah, the carotenoids yeah. complexes. So, so, you know, yes, okay. colouring birds is, you know, not that harmful because they, they live on that sort of stuff. Yeah. They eat all this, the, the, the fungus and, the sp- and all that, that sort of yeah, green well, mouldy yeah. stuff. So, uh-huh. yeah, colouring birds may not kill them and that sort of thing. So let's say you got this cold and flu, and you because you, you also squeeze lemon in there. Yep. Now lemon has lots of vitamin C, which is good, and all this sort of stuff. Also bioflavonoids and all these sorts of things, which can help the common cold as well. Yeah. So we got that, and that's that's pretty cool. And and what you can also follow up with that is some chicken soup. Yeah. Right. Chicken soup. I love chicken soup, Steve. It's it it makes you feel. Oh, to me, it makes me feel good. Talk about your soul, Steve. I know my you soul. love talking about your soul. I, it's great for my soul. He's an egomaniac. You yeah. don't. Believe, you don't believe in soul. I don't believe souls. I well, can't believe you know, that. That's crazy. I haven't seen a PubMed Look paper on the soul. <laughs> I haven't seen a PubMed on my soul. Were you serious? <laughs> you haven't seen that? All those no. ones about electri- electricity and energy and. Oh, I believe in the exchange and all that sort of stuff. Anywho, yeah. so chicken soup is bloody brilliant. And anyone that says it's not, it's crazy. They just don't know how to make good chicken soup or they're probably taking it out of a tin. Well, now, there's so much stuff that's come from chicken soup. If you have a look at the industry, so there was a one study where they went and realized that people that had a lot of chicken soup had less arthritis. And then they went back and said, what the hell was in chicken soup for that? And mm. they found out there's the ones that used the carcass mm. in the soup and then they had the sternum and all the collagen. And that led through to chicken sternum industry and then through to collagen X. And that has been a big part behind a lot of this booming collagen industry mm. went back from the humble chicken soup. Mm. In the early days, they realized that no one could probably own just collagen and that sort of stuff. When we went back to the collagen story, so... When they went and realised no one could probably own just collagen, you know, because mm. anyone can use it and then just say it's grass-fed or something anyway. Um, but they worked out the chicken sternum and then the collagen X, and then they went through and analysed it and then used that analogy to actually discover chondroitins. And of chondroitins, they discovered glucosamine. <laughs> so of a chondroitin molecule, 5% of the chondroitin molecule is glucosamine. Mm-hmm. Surprisingly, chondroitin has a 5% bioavailability of effective components, which is typically the glucosamine. Yeah. But then they went back and they still, to this day, were going back trying to compare it to see if it was good as chicken soup, which it probably never was, you know, because only one small component. Apart from that, we've got all the electrolytes, like a lot of the other. So apart from the chicken, what would we throw in a chicken soup would be usually whatever else is in the fridge. But if we throw in the old leaves... Yeah, you know, the celery, the celery leaves, mm. throw some celery seeds and that sort of stuff into mm. it and that sort mm. of thing. Um, potatoes, carrots, those sort of things. Apart from the chicken, that is actually the old potassium and magnesium broth recipe. Mm. So you get all your potassium and all your magnesium. Then we also have a nice dose of salt. Yes. And the saltiness with all that water and all those electrolytes is rehydrating. Yes. So that's pretty cool. All of that from one little bucket of chicken Well, it get, get, gets even better than that because that me. salt uh, boosts interleukin-17 inside the, 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 the tracks. And that's so a chemo-attractant? Chemo-attractant. It drags all the immune cells into the drags area. Drags in the immune cells. So so salt boosts the immune system via uh, TLP-17 and interleukin-17 yeah. and interleukin-23, which is parts of the immune system that ramp up to kill bugs. That's amazing. Does it also have that same effect as the sugar of making the cells explode? No. Like it, all the insides come out? It, it attracts all the neutrophils around into that area yeah so it swells up the area with yeah. basically f- fluid and snot and, and all the immune complexes come into that swollen mucosa absolutely so if you get a cuts and scratches because mum we whenever we had cuts and scratches which was constantly mm. and you know, before we put on the mercurochromes i suppose we would go to the beach yeah. so we'd always go to the beach and get into the ocean and get into yeah. that salty water yes. or at home we'd just make up big buckets of salty water or you know, saline solution that we mm. flush out, mm. flush your, your gums and all that sort of stuff, saline solution. Mm. So 
the having that salty water mm. in in a, in a wound and that sort of stuff. It's not just to be mean. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Rubbing salt into the wound is a classic saying, yeah. and it, it does cause uh, that causes osmosis effect with with the bacteria, so it causes the the cells to dehydrate and die. Oh, it does it in that sense. In the, in the salt does, but in the in the body, it yeah. attracts the interleukin seventeen. Yeah, wow, because we're all watery. Exactly. Yeah, so we can't get that concentration within yes. the body. That's right. Also, uh, the bones that it comes from in the in the broth, of the chicken is very high in zinc. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you get a moon boost in that way. Uh, also, those vegetables you add in there have carotenoids and vitamin Cs, which yeah. boost the immune system. I'm just going through this And then if you, yeah, onions and paper. garlics, of course. That's probably the classic home remedy for colds and flus we hadn't even mentioned. Oh. Remember the old onion stuff where they used to always tell you to get the onion and you bake it in the oven mm. and then just squash all the juice out of it. Yeah. And then you can use that locally to kill infections. There you go. I've never done it. I've never done it too much, but I have tried it on myself and a few other people. But it was never a big thing where they do it for ear infections as well. So they squash it all out and put a little bit of the onion, a couple of drops of the onion juice into the ear into canal the, yeah. and it will sterilize and kill things really well. I love it. And love onion, it. there's some really cool data on onion for scarring yeah. too, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Also, also the seasonings, like they use a lot of peppers and those sort of things sometimes oh, yeah, they put yeah. in chicken soup. That works very well. Um, of course, they use uh, peppers and those so sort those of things. So those diaphoretics they diaphoretics. talk about. So you can list off, you can go Google diaphoretic and give mm. you a list of peppers and things that actually make you sweat. And the, the, perp, the process of increasing perspiration yeah. and increasing your body temperature does a yeah. couple of things. What is it? Every degree that your temperature goes up, your immune system goes up. How many fold? Oh, loads. Loads it's, fold. Yeah, loads loads fold. fold. So for every one degree, it's technically loads fold increase in immune system. <laughs> Ship load. Ship load, that's yeah, it. Yeah, as opposed to... Yeah, the other word we can't say. Um, but, yeah. but this is a paper on it, and it goes through all the benefits of it. But the other benefit is is the fact of drinking the soup. They tried, they compared hot and cold soup. Oh, yeah? And, and you know how you drink soup and you... You actually get vapours up your nose and it loosens the mucus. Huh. So it's like... So you should slurp it and I do that... Yeah, the, 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 the slurping. Oh, I'll do it again. Ready? Get a camera. So, and you get yeah. the breathing in up here, and it kills all the. You know, so yeah, it, it's great like that. I love those sort of things. So even the fact of drinking it. Yeah. So um, what did they say? Hot or cold? What do you do? Hot. Hot's better. Hot's so better. you get hot stuff. You get the yeah. diaphoretics like the garlics, the ginger, mm. and that sort of stuff. Some peppers and caspicans and all those sort of things. Yep. You throw all those in there. And they will actually increase your body temperature. It does too. Your body then sweats as well, which mm -hmm. is a good thing. And then that'll actually reduce fever. So yeah. the process of diaphoresis is actually yeah. to heat you up for the purpose of reducing fever. Oh, wow. Yeah. See, see, beautiful. Love, love these papers. So, so what else can we do for a common cold at home? If you've got some garlic, of course, that's antimicrobial. Yeah. Hey, you know, another thing. I was at a seminar the other week and they're talking about sleep. And they said you sleep much better if you're at a lower body temperature. Mm. So if your body's cooler, you sleep better. And they did all these different ways of trying to make that happen. The yeah. best way was a really hot shower. All right. And then you, your actual body temperature drops after the hot shower yeah. and you sleep better. So having a really hot shower might even be good when you when you feel like you're expressing with a fever or would you have a cold shower? Right? This is what I would have a hot shower because of the, the, the you breathe in. Depends what your fever is, I suppose. Yeah. If you're borderline dying or yeah, fe yeah, yeah, yeah. if you're borderline you know, febrile convulsions 40, yeah. and seizures and shit like that, possibly don't push it if you're 40 degrees Celsius. Nah. Maybe if you're at the 37s and 8s area, you could probably push it up a notch and then yeah. sweat and then yeah. have a nice deep sleep. Immune system goes spastic. Um, the other way of, in, of cooling down your body was wearing thick gloves and socks. All oh, right, you know, okay. So it's all about the reactions to the, the heat. Yeah, so yeah. Your body like treats like. Yeah, yeah. Crazy Which is yeah. a great homeopathic remedy. So, okay, so we've got our common cold and flu. What if I told you to eat chocolate? I'd do it, Steve. I'd if you told me to eat chocolate, I'd do it. Because uh, the Journal of Thoracic Disease. What are we doing this for? <laughs> well, if you've got a soothing, a hacking cough. Oh, fuck off. I mean, the, oh, really? Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> to soothe the hacking cough, it I does. can have chocolate? Exactly. It, it, of course well, it, it has to be just dark chocolate. Dark surely. chocolate, 70% or higher. The research was published in the Journal of Thoracic Disease. Dark chocolate is, is even more effective than codeine at soothing a hacking cough. Wow. So now, so now, now the mechanism's wonderful. Yeah. Because of the it's theobromic. Because it's chocolate. Yeah. Chocolate's yeah. wonderful. Yeah, of course. So I've had my honey. Yep. So I've just drizzled the honey all through my throat. Yep. I, this is all because I don't have codeine in the house, obviously. No. So I don't have codeine. So I've, I've, I've coated my, coat, my throat in honey. 
And yeah. now you're offering me chocolate? After your chicken soup. After, yeah, well, yeah, cool. Because it actually works very well because it, it blocks the um, adenosine receptors because of the theobromine. Yeah, wow. So, yeah. And this is interesting because this is where the aminophylline research originally started with um, asthma medications because mm-hmm. aminophylines as a beta receptor agonist and the adenosine inhibition, they dilate bronchioles. Yeah. Huh. So Absolutely. theobromine does, and theobromines are more of a slow-release, longer-lasting effect than a high-powerful... Hit. And this is also too, if you're getting wheezy, if you're really asthma, so with asthma and the wheeziness, you, it's two things. It's either the swelling and the inflammation mm-hmm. from the phlegm and the mucus just clogging up yeah. and the swollen membranes, or it's the constriction. Mm. So when you get the constriction, you can use uh, strong black coffee as well, because mm. we just get a really nice dose of theophylline. Yeah. So you get theobromine from the cacao, cacao. and then we get theophylline from our um, coffee. Yeah. Or you can have a ventil and salbutamol, which hits the same receptor and that sort of stuff. But if you don't have one, have a strong black coffee and a shitload of dark chocolate. Awesome, eh? Hell yeah. Now, now what if you're having trouble sleeping after all that? Because of the coffee? (laughs) Because of what? Because you don't have the coffee. Because you're all that sort of thing. You know, you can chew cherries. Which, which are actually a source of melatonin. How much though, Steve? Uh, about two milligrams. Oh, wow. Yeah. In how much cherries? Oh, they said a dose of it, so a handful. Oh, actually, yeah, a, a handful of cheruby, cherries. Yeah, a handful of cherubies? Cherubies. Gives us two milligrams of melatonin. Yeah. So typically a, a dose of melatonin. I always usually get like three milligram three. or something capsules just to yeah. screw with our mass here. And then I'll take tell people to take, you know, one, two or three of those. I very rarely use over 10 milligrams. So mm. luckily we only got two hands. So yeah. you could probably have a handful of cherries on each side. Yeah. And then um, that'll get you about four milligrams of melatonin, which should be enough. And, and of course, all the beautiful vitamin C's and all the other stuff in the yeah. cherries are good for you too, all the tartness. So, so we hey, really... Steve, I eat cherries a lot during the day, but they don't make me sleepy. Oh, don't they? No. Well, melatonin doesn't put you to sleep. It just helps you give you more it's effective deep sleep. sleep maintenance. Yeah. Huh? It does knock out norepinephrine or anything like that. So it's mm. good. Um, what if I told you to have some licorice root, not the candy? I'd probably say, bugger off, Steve. I don't like licorice. Nah. But why would you say that, Steve? Because <laughs> Maybe helps, you uh, could convince me. It helps soothing the, the mucous membranes as well as being an expectorant. So oh, yeah, cool. It sort of drifts into the, you know, a lot of people don't have licorice root at home, but no. it does. It's a home remedy in and a way. That, so the, a lot of people might have licorice bullets and that at home, yeah. but that's not going to cut no. it. Huh? <laughs> yeah. So no. licorice root. And the funny thing is licorice, even it is a good thing to have at home. Um, yeah. Go into the Asian grocery stores and that sort of stuff and buy the actual sticks and twigs of the licorice so you yep. can make up a proper tea yep. without all other weird stuff in it. Um, an interesting thing about licorice, it has a very similar chemical structure and that sort of stuff. The the, the glycorrhizans yep. have a very similar chemical structure to cortisols, which mm. is like a prednisone, which is yeah. a soothing anti-inflammatory action straight away there. It's terrific. It's really good for you for lots of reasons. Um, so, so it's a good one. It's also, uh, you know, upregulates, as you said, cortisol levels by... Uh, yeah. And it also levels. inhibits the uh, 11-beta-hydroxy steroid dehydrogenase that yeah. converts it uh, into the inactive cortisone that then has a fluid retention effect or something. Exactly, it does. So it, it preserves the half-life of your cortisol. So it's a kind of thing, if you've got a low blood pressure... Um, low blood volumes or if you've got what we think is adrenal exhaustion that you can take licorice tea all morning yeah. um, into the afternoon but don't have it at night because you don't want to be keeping your cortisol high exactly night, huh? you don't want cortisol high yeah. at night but no uh, one has licorice you know no no so, really so have we kind of done the colds and flus thing or do we anything else we want to add to that uh i, don't know, I feel all right good i feel much better now because the supermarket <laughs> has lots of reishi mushrooms and all these sorts of things oh. if you wanted to Reishi mushrooms, brilliant. Yeah. And you know, we have we got it in our resilience product. Mm. But I have a jar of it at home that mm. I buy just bulk reishi mushroom. Yep. It's beautiful stock. It's like gives that umami flavor. So you can use it like stock cubes. Mm. And the therapeutic dose for reishi where they did all the really high end stuff was like six grams. That's mm. a teaspoon mm. of just straight reishi powder. Reishi, yeah. So you could easily add a teaspoon into your soups and throw teaspoon into your reishi into your um chicken, chicken and soup. veggie soup so mm. so far my chicken and veggie soup it's going to be made of the chicken carcass mainly because yes. i'm more interested in getting all the collagen and bone stuff than i am the meat and the skin mm. so the cool the perfect thing is, is you eat all the meat and skin and something nice mm-hmm. like a salad or whatever and yeah. the leftover thing you throw in Could um be. and a lot make sure you get that neck sections and that sort of stuff as yeah. well because that's when we're going to get a really whole heap of the, all these weird 
kind of stuff and you want to make sure you get lots of sternum and everything then we're going to throw in some reishi mushrooms as a stock we're going to throw in the onion and the garlic and the ginger um when you throw in things like celery try to keep celery seeds at home because that's a real more potent form of the celery yes Um, very good for diuretics and that Mm. but the leaves off the celery are amazing um so don't just get just the celery and throw all the other good stuff away um what else we put in our chicken soup so far? Oh, we're look, gonna you have put the diaphoretics. Peppers in there. Yeah, yeah. So we're going to have some pepper. And yeah. We're going to have lots of salt. Don't hold back on the salt for this. Mm. Make it a nice, bloody, salty soup so it tastes good too. Um, and then the process of cooking this stuff right down liberates all the glutamates, which gives you all that flavor enhancement yeah. anyway. So you shouldn't need to add a whole heap of sauces or flavoring agents. And you definitely don't need to add all the stuff they put in the tins um, to get that yeah. flavor up. You just cook it for that little bit longer and you're going to get that flavor, huh? I wish I was clever in the kitchen. That, that, that sort of stuff I love doing but mm. uh, you know i'm not 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 so good with it but that's a great sort of thing and then you have those, those other things we said afterwards now now garlic also if you paint garlic you know you get the raw garlic and put it on the bottom of your feet and put socks on yeah that actually gets in your system yeah problem is it'll burn the shit out of your skin <laughs> so you got to i mean i did <laughs> it for careful. some baby ones I was oh like, baby this old thing you know you put your crushed up garlic right. on the soles of the feet you'll yeah. go through and then oh yeah 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 and then did it and it worked really well and they come back and man it really burnt the soles of the skin so put something down like a gauze or two pairs of socks so put yeah. a thin pair of socks then put the garlic through yeah. and then some more and maybe not just leave it there for days yeah. um yeah but it, it and you'll taste it huh yeah. Even um, we make a product, Capzia, um, which is just a pain linen based on capsaicins and that sort of stuff. You put that on the soles of the feet, you can taste it. It gets mm. right in amongst I'm it. I'm going to try that one. I'll never forget one guy rang me up, freaked out that he used it as a, because um, it's a roll on. Yeah. He had it in his gym bag and he put it in his underarms. And he rang oh. up and said, man, I can taste it. Should I go to the hospital? And I said, no, no, it'll be fine. But yeah. Look, it's 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 really quite quite. So Vicks as well, menthol on the soles of the feet. Yeah, menthol. Remember that old one? Yeah. So we get the menthol camphers and that yep. sort of stuff on the soles of the feet, mm. and you can actually it helps to, it you you breathe it. Mm. Yeah, and you, it starts coming out through your lungs and it opens up the airways, breaks up the mucus. So awesome, that, that actually isn't it? works, hey. Yeah. It does some weird stuff. It, it turns up. Yeah. So after your chicken soup for dessert, you have some of those um, dark chocolate. Yep. Some yep. dark chocolate and cherries. Cherries. So you're gonna. Do yourself, I mean, this is on top of all those other, we're not talking supplements here, but this yeah. is just those home remedies that we're going to talk about for the common cold being winter. It's really So good. when I go to sleep yeah. with a cough and a cold, because yeah. every time I lie down, my head fills up with snot. Yeah. This is gross. Not yeah. just every time I lie. No, we're, we're talking about, okay, imagine I've got a head cold. Head cold, yeah. And then I lie down and then all of a sudden I start coughing. And I start. Mm. So should I put my pillow up or... Funny. Elevate? Yeah, it's funny you mention that because the oh, monks... Well, kind of scripted a little, wasn't it? Yeah, a little bit. But, but, <laughs> I knew you were going to talk about it, something I, about some monks. Oh, let's yeah, yeah, upright. Yeah, yeah, I, I sleep upright. Yeah. Opposite, in fact. Exactly. We love garlic and we sleep upright. <laughs> exactly. And, but we still don't, both don't like a steak through the heart, I'm sure. We were both on the unity ticket with the vampires. Steak. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so, so if you sleep upright, you've got to make sure your head's supported because when you go into REM sleep, of course, you lose muscle tone, so your head can go to the side. Have you ever seen those people on the train falling asleep and they go, you know? I've felt it. Oh, I've you even felt, felt it? it in my own head in the seminar. I didn't realize I was fully REM. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's when you, got, you lose muscle tone with REM sleep. Yeah. So sleeping upright, you've got to have your head supported and all this sort of stuff. So yeah. that's the thing. Second thing, you don't want to put too much pressure on your buttock because you can get DVTs. But there are ways of doing it that you can, you know, DVTs is deep vein thrombosis. Why did you put two hands up when you're talking about the pressure on my buttocks? You just made it really awkward, I'm just, Steve. just relieving Do it gently. Pressure. Yes, there we go. <laughs> just a nice That's better. Dipping so ha- hang on. How do we sleep upright without being on our bum? Well, the, the monks. Buttocks? Yeah, the monks sleep in a box. What? Uh, yeah. I know. They are vampires. <laughs> <laughs> they, are, they, they they sleep for five hours in the night. When they're sick, they're often coughing. <laughs> I can fix that cough. We got we got the chocolate for the cough. And they're sleeping upright. So carry on. These monks don't sleep upright, do they? Seventy degree upright. No, Ninety degrees is that. So seventy degrees is sort of if we go to the. So they just lean them back. I fell yeah. over a bit. Lean, lean them back a bit, and they cross their legs and they sit on a pillow. That can't be. That can't be good. That's Could not, it? Well, you know, bum grapes and. Yeah, varicose veins from your legs getting they, all squashed I and know, stuff. I know, I'm not a fan, but they, they I know sleep. You're not a fan. So that's a silly analogy. You look nothing like a fan. <laughs> so, so they um they sleep like for five hours because then it gives them more time I to bet meditate. They do. Yeah, yeah, it wouldn't be any longer. Wouldn't would you it? want to sleep for eight hours like properly? 
You know, I would, but these guys. Well, what? Hang on. Why does it? What's the benefit in that? Because then they get more time to pray. No, no, no. That, that's their benefit. Yeah, no. Regardless of that, that why would they sleep sitting up, like oh. leaning against a wall? With they, their, their, bum face, their, their legs, their, and, their direction for praying, and that sort of thing. That's their philosophy. I don't agree with it. Well, why? Why is this a home room? Well, tell us the relevance of this story. The relevance is that when you need to sleep upright, when you've got your head full of snot, oh, that's right. support your shit. neck. Carry on. Yeah, support your neck with one of those neck pillows that come around here. Hang on. Monks do not have travel neck pillows. <laughs> no, they actually they actually tie their head they to the tie, board. This is just getting out of control, Steve. <laughs> you ask about it. Whose home are you getting these remedies from? <laughs> so, what? Yeah, I, carry I, on. Okay, so so if you need to sleep upright because you've got a cold and that, the monks do one way. I don't agree with that way. This is the way. Oh, I'm now you all of a sudden you don't agree with it. All of a sudden it was like home remedies from the monks to save the world. Now we don't agree with it. To carry I, on. I've, I've slept upright when you've got those lung infections, that sort of thing, but you just have to support your head because your you norepinephrine levels, you know, lose and then you lose your muscle tone and then you, you, you get a crow neck and you wake up and you're all sore. I've, I've fallen for that one a few times. So make sure you support your neck if you're going to sleep upright when you've got a cold. Oh, good. Probably good for heartburn too. Heartburn? Stops everything from falling up yep. and keeps everything down. And I know with a chest, if you're a really phlegmy chest and you sleep upright, you don't cough as much when you're asleep. But that's because you're not clearing anything out of your chest. Exactly. So you're probably better off doing some pummeling and clear as much out of your can as possible before you go to sleep. Well, the people with CFS sleep upright. Um, um, oh, sorry, oh. CF, um, they, they have um, cystic, cystic fibrosis. fibrosis yeah. Yeah, yeah. They sleep upright because their lungs. Um, but also people with a hiatus hernias. Oh, they, yeah. they sleep upright so they don't get that esophageal reflux. Yep, yep, yep. But again, it's it's not good long term. So if I've got think. like uh, edema in my feet and that sort of stuff and swelling, I'll put my feet up as yeah. well. Yeah. And so it's all these lymphatic. So with the brain, we have glial cells that regulate the lymphatic drainage channels through our brain. And for that reason, it's called the glymphatic system. And it regulates the water movement through our brain and the cerebral spinal fluid mm. and everything like that. So cerebral spinal fluid then through the brain stem and through our spinal cord and it's all regulated by posture and mm. all that sort of stuff. So in our body, the lymphatic system has muscles that pump it. Okay, so the, the, you get, the best way to get rid of lymphatic congestion is exercise mm. and that sort of stuff. So with the brain, when we're sitting up, it makes sense that we'd be able to drain, all that stuff would drain mm. out easier. But the, the thing is that confuses me a bit with it is that as we're sleeping, we get an increase in water of our brain by about 60%. Mm. So what happens is these water floods these channels. And as the channels flood, because our skull's a certain size, the white and gray matter kind of shrinks off a little mm. bit while mm. we're sleeping mm -hmm. to open up these channels to allow this water to regulate through the cerebral spinal fluid. They've been trying to work out for years what the best posture is for the regulating the lymphatics in our brain. Of course, if you've got neck problems, you've got postural problems, traps, you know, big rank hutch back or spinal stenosis, calcification happening through your inner ear, mm. um, uh, through your, the spinal cord and all that sort of weird stuff that we're seeing all the time. These are big signs that you're not flushing that mm. water in and out of your brain properly when you sleep. And it's also really important then to get proper cycles at one and a half hours, you know, those 90 minute cycles mm. over and over again, you know, trying to get a good eight hours sleep or something mm. like that so we can flush all this water away mm. when they did the studies on the animals they found rats for example are better off curled up on their side right yeah and then they found that's how rats sleep um then they worked out all these different animals they worked out naturally the way those animals sleep you know either in a fetal position or something like that was the best way for that right now with humans i was wasn't sure because i was curious as if maybe that would help if we had our thing up because it helps that drainage but it's it's equally important to have the the fluid flushing up as it is flushing out <laughs> so then then i was a bit confused so i've done a little bit more research and it it looks like we're better off on our sides so where they call it recumbent lateral mm. sleeping um left or right and probably a bit of switching around so we're supposed to move a little bit because that's also part of these aiding these drainage channels mm. so we're not supposed to be just straight flat on our back or mm. straight on our front um, when I used to do surf lifesaving stuff, and I remember that uh, I can't remember actually what they called it, it was recovery a position, recovery position, yeah. something stupid like. Um, and so we used to have this thing where they so you're on the side yeah. with that one leg over, yeah. the other leg straight, yeah. and that there, and uh, so all the drool can fall out yeah. and all that sort of stuff. So that seems to be the best way to sleep to regulate lymphatic stuff through our brain. That would still be cool to do, like colds and flus and that sort of stuff. Absolutely. It should still help all that drainage yeah. because you're going to have 
surely it's going to be all linked. I mean, I, I can't imagine the lymphatic system that runs through the brain not working the same way as through the sinuses, mm. the ear. Mm. The eust- if you imagine the eustachian tubes, that's going to go down into that throat and that opened airways, mm. the ability mm. to breathe. Mm. And you probably even find posturally sleeping on your side with a cold and a flu and that sort of stuff you can actually breathe out one side of your sinuses might free up a little mm. bit while the other one fills and then we mm. can switch so switch. so while we're sleeping don't do what the monks do those guys don't even get colds and flus and they definitely didn't have cherries before bed exactly so you um I, I think that makes a lot of sense yeah, hey, that side sleeping or you can still breathe i mean that was a way when people were unconscious we kept them breathing so i mean surely with a cold and a flu that would be the way it is and and because you get into a deeper sleep too you get more recovery now now as you know cold and flu tablets have antihistamines in there not so much to reduce histamine but to yeah. put you to sleep yeah it's because right. they realize that sleeping is a very very important way to heal yeah and you know even if you sleep for like if you're a bit sick and you go to sleep for half an hour people say i'll oh, wake up i feel a hell of a lot better yeah and that that's how that's the re, re, that is a great home remedy sleep and it sweat. doesn't sound like, like when yeah. you go into that deep sleep when you've got a cold yeah. and flu your immune system goes crazy it does so when you go into those deep sleep your cortisol levels drop mm. as much as they can drop under yeah. an immune challenge which is why again you have stupid dreams mm. and weird busy dreams when you're crook mm. because of these constant signals that are coming through as a stress response yeah. saying if you're not punching something and fighting you should be hiding yeah. i don't go into that deep sleep but if you can get into that deep sleep and you break out in that sweat mm. your immune your temperature rises and that sort of stuff as well and that helps kill off the bugs it's a great yeah and also in case cells drive up when you sleep too which is what kills bugs natural killer cells so sleeping is a great home remedy weirdly yeah and it's a one that we we all can do but what we need to do is do it better and it sounds weird because when i was trained it was like make sure they get seven to eight hours of sleep but what sort of sleep that just put them to bed. Yeah. And it was, wasn't discussed. Yeah. And and now we know that there's hygienic sleep and there's all these electromagnetic radiations and all these things to help us sleep better. And sleeping on our side is one such thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's it's vitally important. I think that's one of the hey, best you can do. What's that? You're you're a um, physics kind of guy. Ah, oh, yeah. You there was this theory. Yeah. That And I, I do it. I don't know why I still do it. But I always rig up my bed so my head goes to the north mm. and then my feet to the south. And... I honestly thought it was because I used to do a lot of camping and I used to sleep in tents. And then if you didn't do it that way, you got woken up by the sun. Yeah. So I always thought it was something to do with just not having the sun in your eyes. But there's some magnetism theory. What do you, what happened there? Is. There is. As you know, the earth, and I'm sorry to go a bit physics here, but. Don't apologize. Oh. I started this. I said, Steve, you're a physics guy. <laughs> Can you tell us a bit about this magnet stuff? Well, if you think of the earth as a big ball, right? 7,900 kilometers across. Most of the inside is molten iron. Yep. Okay, that's why when you dig a hole deep, you know, 10 kilometers, it heats up. Yeah, well. the, the, the earth is spinning at a thousand kilometers an hour. But the, as you know, when, when something's spinning, there's something catching up to it. So the molten iron is causing friction inside there. And when metals move, it creates a magnetic field. Yeah. Now, we just call it the North and South Pole. Yeah. But this is a bit more technical. So think of the magnetic waves coming out of the North Pole and back into the South Pole. Now, if you yeah. take a, a bar magnet, one of those ones, that's if you put them on iron filings, this was Physics yeah. 101, the iron filings make the shape of the thing. So there's basically electric electromagnetic radiation running through the entire Earth. Yeah, right. And the theory is that if you sleep with your head to the north and feet to the south, you get a better sleep because it aligns with the magnetic field. Yeah. And I thought it was BS, but as, as it really is actually true. That's and crazy, hey? It's simply because, I mean, electro... Do you know what I'm thinking about right now while you're talking? I'm just imagining if the world stopped spinning, would you go smashing into that wall? <laughs> like, I can't, it's, it isn't it, it's a trip to think that right now we're spinning like how fast are we spinning about you know a thousand that? kilometers an hour i knew you'd know that shit now imagine <laughs> if we suddenly stop we just smack into that wall right there at a thousand kilometers an hour yeah but we won't stop but because we, it's, it's weird yeah what what did you say because of newton's New, newton's law second law yeah which means that you you'll keep going unless and uh, uh, uh force acts in the opposite direction there's no yeah, the force wall. <laughs> no, no, I'm saying it's stuck to the earth. Yeah, but if you, yeah, that just spins. It just fully trips me out that we can't feel ourselves spinning. Well, you know, you know, our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, we're, we're in a spiral nebula on the outside, so we're going fast relative to the spiral nebula. So yeah. speed is relative. Like if you're sitting inside a car yeah. with your eyes closed, you might be able to feel the car moving, but you don't actually really know you're going 100 kilometers yeah. an hour. And you can sit there and throw a ball yeah. in the air and then catch it, and it's like. 
Be- because weird, the ball's that... going 100 when it leaves your hand yeah. and it lands at 100. I know. It just. Oh, man, you should have been a physicist. This no, is the shit that we talk no, about no, all day. If I was a, I'd be mental. <laughs> If, I'm bad enough as it is, but if you gave me, if imagine if someone introduced me to like quantum physics, I'd just, I'd fully flip out. Quantum is basically the study of the very, very, very small. Yeah. Because the the laws of Newtonian laws that we're talking about now break down when we go into the microscopic. Yeah. They don't work. Yeah. They they change. And Einstein died trying to reconcile the the macro with the microphysics, and he couldn't figure it out. The Man. both of them. How the hell did Ant-Man breathe when he's so small? The oxygen molecule would have been bigger than him. <laughs> did he shrink his own, take yeah. his little ox- own oxygen with him? <laughs> well, he, he went into the quantum realm, which That's is... That's like sub- the ultimate bends. Imagine yeah. him trying to come back up. There would be no oxygen in the quantum realm because that, if you're the size of, a, say, a proton, there's, of course, as you know, 16 protons in, a, in, a, um, yeah. in an oxygen molecule. And so wow. it's the 16 times the size of you. Home Remedy 101. Do yeah. not shrink down to quantum level size to go fix electronics or That's anything. That's next on my list here. You might get the bends on the way back. You get the bends on the way back. Nitrogen bubbles in the, in the thing. That's the bends. So, so mm. this quantum physics and, and the physics of I've got a feeling the, that Ant-Man's not true. No. Come on, next thing you'll be saying Superman's not true. Don't go there, Steve. No. Oh. So, so <laughs> this, this electromagnetic radiation is real. And have you ever seen homing pigeons? Oh, yeah. Not in my home. Yeah, no, yeah. No, but someone but else. They, they, you know, they, they drive off in a truck for a thousand kilometers and they can find their way back to the... That's amazing. <laughs> oh, the whole time I thought they were flying around. <laughs> like in a flock no in the competitions they they, they drive, drive them themselves out. to the comp they drive themselves yeah little <laughs> little things on the wheel man that reminds me of a story me and my mate were driving behind this truck um once me and dan dan nagel if you're out there a big shout out hey we were driving and um he was drunk no oh. <laughs> no he wasn't anyway we we're behind this truck and it was like a chook truck and this little chook was like, and his arm was coming. There's like little wing come out. They were like, yeah, go chook, go. There's like head come out. There's other wing. There's like, Pew! And this old chook come flying out and then ran away. We're like, go chook, go. Oh. <laughs> it was like very exciting. Moment. It made it. It made it. Made it. it. Oh, that's oh. awesome. Pre so, edited that out. That was a relevant, irrelevant yeah, story. But right. it's fucking so, amazing. So, I just remembered it. So this electromagnetic radiation obviously has an effect. Hang on. What's that got to do with our homing pigeons driving trucks? <laughs> Tell us about the homing well, pigeons driving trucks. that's how they navigate trucks. back to the actual little house where they live a thousand kilometres away. What? What? The, the electromagnetic radiation coming out of the earth. The house? How do they navigate? That's how they what? navigate. But what? That's how homing pigeons navigate back to where they live. What? That doesn't make sense. I know. It's, it doesn't make sense, but that's how they do it. No, but how does their house... How do they... Their house, just because we had North and South Pole, they're just like... If you had a compass, you can navigate your oh, way around. So you're around. talking like compass sort of shit. They have an right. internal compass. Oh. And that's all a compass is. It's, it's a magnetic piece of metal that follows the electromagnetic radiation. They've yeah. got one in their brain that can be extraordinarily accurate and points them straight back to and their the house. And the flock itself, the way they all move in yeah. unison is all in a big electric, electromagnetic field as well. It's all perception. That's what they've got their eyes on the side of the head. It's a really weird thing, like bats with their echo systems. It's, yeah. it, they, they have amazing... Um, um, processes to find their way around, Holy but this is that, that's how powerful. So wait this a minute, is. why are we talking about homing pigeons in home remedy? Probably they can Be- go to the chemist and get your coat in. <laughs> you don't have to do all this other stuff. That's it, get the coat in. <laughs> well, then, go, take your truck. Go get, get, get your truck. Get, get, get me some coat in. Truck, get home, get a strap over the coat in. And, and leave um, old Peter the pigeon there to drive the truck home. That's right. Well, Peter the pigeon uses these powerful electromagnetic radiation that's going Called through Nav every Man. single yeah. He used Google Maps, oh, Peter, because he's just the truck driver. Exactly. The rest of them are homing pigeons. Exactly. So that's so powerful. These guys can find back to their little hen back home, right, their little house, and we're sleeping in this every day and every night. You're sleeping in their house? In this electromagnetic radiation cesspool. Why don't you get your own house instead of sitting in the (laughs) pigeon's electromagnetic radioactive cesspool? (laughs) What are you talking about, Steve? That's why we have to sleep north and south. (laughs) <laughs> so right. this stuff goes through it it doesn't we don't interfere with it that's the theory right. behind it and a slight inclination if you're a monk if you're a monk 70 degrees 70 degrees head tied to head the fence. To the, that's it see this is this is good and information your feet crossed yeah your feet crossed like on, no on cough your no heartburn nothing if nothing. you're a monk hiatus hernia say goodbye to the high high to the hiatus hernia and say goodbye to it because it gets better that's terrible steve <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, now 
All right. So you want another one? Yeah, please. All right, let's go. What about your teeth? Are they white enough? They're, I think they're fantastic, actually. Why? What are you trying? Well, you can use bicarbonate soda to whiten your teeth. I do like doing that, actually. They're actually fizzy put and refreshing. It, yeah, and they put it in uh, toothpaste now. Mm. But you can also use strawberries. Why? What? 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 Stra- what? Yeah. You can mash three or four of them to pulp, sprinkle them on baking soda, and then put them in your mouth and it whitens your teeth. Rubbish. Oh, that's really? What they're bright red. Too. University in Smungbird, Indonesia found this out. That yeah. it whitens teeth. With strawberries. And baking soda. Strawberries and baking soda. Strawberries and baking soda. Oh, I, I actually teeth. usually have both of those at home. And toothpaste, but... Usually, if, I don't, if I don't have toothpaste, I'll give that a crack. <laughs> exactly. And charcoal too, eh? That's, charcoal? That's black. The, I was about to say bright black. It, that's it, black, black. It's black and it, it's abrasion on the, um, of course, all the biofilm on your teeth. Oh, so is it not good? No, it's good. Oh, it is good. It is good. So biofilm's the plaque that the bugs build to protect themselves. Yeah. I call that rendering to protect my wonderful teeth. Yeah. Because <laughs> when I chip that off, they're white. Yeah, yeah. So that's not good. We okay. want to break we, up that we, biofilm. That's what you go to the dentist for and they give that high-pressure hose in your mouth and shh, get and rid of all And we use that. charcoal. Could Baking you combine soda? charcoal and strawberries and These that, guys didn't it? in the study, but why not? What's in tomatoes that... Um, what are we talking about tomatoes for? What's in strawberries that make your teeth go white? Elegic acid breaks down the biofilm. Really? Yeah. Man, that is fascinating. And it you know what's really cool? <laughs> but you know what else is really cool about that? Because the elagic acid, yeah. elagic acid in response to the microbiome that lives in your mouth actually converts into these things called urolithins, which are really powerful at interacting with bone to increase bone. They're very powerful at increasing the strength of your jaw and improving dental properties just through the estrogen receptor modification. How interesting is that? I found it very interesting. That's why I thought I'd bring it up. Huh. There's some really cool ones here. There's a there's another one for chap lips, which is olive oil. And I went. It's pretty mm. boring. It's a bit boring until you realise the, the mechanism of action, and it's the polyphenols in it. Uh-oh. And it was published in the International Journal of, of Research in Cosmetic Science. Never heard of that journal, but I went, wow, that's good. So it works very, very well. So it's to do with the polyphenols in it. So it's not just an oil making you feel good. Yeah, it's the polyphenols. That's what I thought it would have been just an oiliness. That's what to I make thought. I was, I was going to go. Forget that one. Don't worry about that one. So, huh. um, really good. And what about if you're you're out and you you know you get bitten by midges and all that sort of thing? What do you do about that? No, I, I scratch them. Scratch them. What em. do you do? What do you do? I, I put um, potato on them. Bullshit. I put potato on them. No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> but no, this this is published in the Agriculture of Immunology um, Journal, and it really does help raw potato. And then what? Why? It's basically anti-inflammatory properties, and you just have raw potatoes, and it works. Because there's, there's other things. So with the potatoes, you grade up the potatoes. You know, previously, while I've been breastfeeding, I've done that um, to fix yeah. my mastitis. Right. So that, that's a r- real thing. Is that through anti-inflammatory mechanisms as well? Uh, I'm not sure about that one. I know cabbage leaves are, are due to anti-inflammatory. Yeah. Leaves. Can yeah. you do like... Um, poultice of potato for other injuries or anything Would yeah you can you know, when i had inflamed knees when i had the arthritis many years ago i was told told about that and i put them on my knees and they felt better i couldn't see any swelling going down but they definitely felt better is that right and everyone thought i was weird but i, I was doing the thing potato on the oh. greater thing and myself and what about me everywhere i travel i take those big bags of um electric soda those sodium carbonate crystals it just looks like i'm um ice mule um, because yeah. I carry these big bags of crystals everywhere I go, mm. and every time I get my little um flyer to say that the customs have opened my bag and checked it. Um, typically, what I found with those is uh, you get the soda crystals and they absorb moisture out of stuff. Yeah, they do. Um, and you put them in the, I, I just put them in. So what I do, I put them in the socks. So normally I wear socks during the day, and then I use those socks. I fill them up with soda crystals and I wrap them around the, any swollen joints. And then you go to sleep or something. Mm. Oh, don't wrap it and then go to mm. sleep. Like yeah. you, you make a pillow and put disclaimers in. Yeah. And then you basically um, you wake up like three hours later and it's all crusty and rank. And all your, your, your swollen limb is like shrunk down and all wrinkly like a scrotum. Mm. And oh. all the fluids just come out. It looks wow. like, you know, when you're, um, you're in the salty water or something mm. in the water yep. and you get the pruny fingers pruny and that, fingers, it can yeah. do that. That's how much fluid it's like sucking out. That's amazing. So that's cool. And that's um, sodium carbonate crystals. We In Australia, they're called electric soda or they're washing soda crystals that used Baking to add soda. for the hard water when there was mm. too much calcium in the water. It mm. doesn't lather up. So you find it. And that's cool because you put it in your laundry anyway. Yeah. Um, and it makes it much, much softer. There's wash. two reasons why we used to put sodium bicarbonate in the, in the dishwashing dishes when we used to develop it. The first one was the hard water because hard water stops lathering. Yeah, and, and that's hard water's calcium, huh? 
Yeah, calcium and, and, magnesium. and magnesium. And so the, the carbonate would bind with the calcium magnesium, form an insoluble salt and be washed out. But then the, the water would lather up. Yeah. And the other one was to, to increase the pH to kill the microbes in your, in your clothes. Yeah. So as you um, don't smell any more clothes. Huh. That's, 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 the, that, that's why we used to put it in there. Oh, well, that's so clever. Oh, yeah. We, yeah. we were super clever in those days. Yeah, so that's <laughs> a, so those crystals. What else can we use on a swollen joint? Oh, so we got. I oh know. I'm, I'm just hijacking this section. No, but, no, no. Because we got. We talked about the the um, soda crystals and the potato. That's about it, huh? Comfrey. That's... Comfrey. If you got to grow them, was bloody brilliant. The problem oh, is yeah. comfrey. It's got these funny little hairs on it. it irritates Ooh, the yeah. shit out of your skin. A lot of people. There's a reputations of comfrey being very good for ulcers and mm. stomach ulcers internally as well. Mm. But I don't think we're allowed to tell people to take it internally in Australia. In England, you are. Yeah, well, that's because in Australia there's a section of the Darling Downs. I think where they got some poisoning. But what they didn't disclose was that. A tiny comfrey leaf has mm. the same amount of iridoid glycosides in it. A fresh baby iridoid glycoside leaf is the same as a big one. So the you get a big comfrey leaf, yeah. it's got the same amount of poison as a tiny leaf. So yeah. when you eat, if you're just going around indiscriminately eating the small leaves, you get poisoned. Um, but it still took a number of hectares yeah. worth of consumption over a long period of time for the cows to get sick, but they still banned it it's just... in humans for internal consumption. Yeah, and it's safe for people in England, but not for Australians. Yeah. So oh, anyway, if you do it, put down a poultice, for, put down like a, a tea towel or something, wet tea towel or something first, and then you you bash up your... Yeah, I always I always do that. Hey, I used to get the poultices. It makes it work faster, I reckon, too. So I used to get the... I'd, I'd just soak the tea towels and yeah. make them in hot water sort yeah. of thing. And I'd make like a cup of tea in it and then I'd put the leaves in it and then yeah. I'd bash them and then wrap it on. Nice. And I find you get more of the stuff coming in. But comfrey was an amazing one for that. I love it. Um, and, man, it's hard, to, it's hard to kill. You get some of that growing. It, it's oh, good. I- so I used to yeah. grow it when I was studying because uh, it was banned and I still used to use it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> I used yeah. to make up. But that was... Yeah, know, clay. Days. Like I know a lot of indigenous communities make like a clay kind of poultice that, yeah. and let it go hard. Like, Is it just acting like a splint or is there other things No, no, clay? It, it, there, there is clay that is particularly diatomaceous earth clay. Yeah. It's very good for drawing fluids out. Yeah, right. Eh? Yeah, so what, that's what, what was remember. that word you just said? Oh, diatomaceous earth. Yeah. It, it's great for binding toxins. For example, and I'll go back to my soap days as a chemist, we used to put it in the soap mix because it would bind up all the toxins out of the animal intestines. Yeah, right. And that's what what is, it, is it negatively charged or something and absorbs positively yeah, charged yeah, things? Yeah, it's exactly right. It's yeah, got right. anions in it and, and it binds it up and forms an insoluble salt and you just purify that out. Yeah. So Because soap's made from animal intestines and animal brains and animal bits that you don't eat yeah and um the fatty parts yeah. and then you just add it with caustic soda and you end up it, it, it's a reaction called a saponification reaction you put diatomaceous earth in there to get rid of the impurities yeah you end up with soap and then a huh. chemical called lye yeah lye which turns into glycerine yeah right. make glycerine soap so that's how soap's made and you use diatomaceous earth to remove the impurities and so so with people if you and this is another thing i recommend people add to their home remedies so get some clay and mm. keep it at home and i always get the australian healing clay and that mm. sort of stuff only because i'm always nervous about other places you know what's mm. in their dirt because yeah. it's going to be absorbed into the clay like a sponge yeah. so and then like so my kids they know like if because my kids crazy they'll go around and just start smashing all these mushrooms off the ground <laughs> like kicking them and then they'll go back and they come in and tell you that they tasted funny or something Ooh, ah. so anyway they'll come where's my dirt water dirt so water. my kids will come in and ask for dirt water so yeah. we actually get the water and the teaspoons of the clay and anything that's like a potential poison or mm. a toxin or even if you've got a, an infection or mm. gastritis we always throw the clay in and it's the best way just to absorb up the toxin but be aware that it's absorbing anything that's good too mm. so it'll take in all the positive um charged calciums and magnesiums and all that sort of stuff as well so you don't so, have it every day but it's a great remedy yeah yeah it's good good life-saving thing and then the funny thing is is where i where i first got excited about it when yeah. i was a kid i was watching a documentary you know david rabbit Burrow does those documentaries <laughs> rabbit and going, oh, i'm hanging around the water hole and yeah. you know all the animals come in and there was one pile of clay and so all the animals in the jungle went to the clay once a day and there was like this weird like little truce thing going on. You know, they mm. don't try not to kill everyone, you know. And yeah. they all come in because they're all eating berries and all this weird stuff out mm. of the jungle mm. that mm. often had a lot of poisons in them. Mm. Then they go and smash this clay every day yeah. to actually go through and absorb a lot of the poisons so they yes. could get all the benefits from the fruit and veg and not the toxins. Amazing. Yeah, cool, eh? I love it. And I watched that and that's why I was like so fascinated by this clay. And then I just started looking right into clay. Clay is really good. And again, if you've got the clay, I find it is the best makeup remover. 
as a cleanser and that sort of stuff. So I get the clay, add a little bit of moisture to it. Should I ask how you know this? No, mate. mate it's, and it leaves it silky soft. But I find I have to double cleanse on a heavy makeup day. Right. Um, and I go through and I use it. And, oh, mate, the silkiness of it. Even even I let the wife use it sometimes. Sometimes, yeah. Um, but that is the best for mm. that sort of thing. And it's so perfect. And also, too, dry skin brushing. So, again, we got those cellulite creams mm. and we've got all those other skin stuff that's mm. going on. If you do dry skin brushing... Um, mm get those lymphatics moving with a dry mm. skin brushing, clear out the pores and that sort of stuff. Then you mm. put some clay. You make And you get clay, make it like a paint, butter up and then let it dry. And it, it seems to open up, it cleans out all the, and unclogs all those pores. But you let it dry and then brush it all off and everything goes so silky smooth. It gets rid of all those old layers of dead skin yeah. and all that sort of stuff. It's so awesome. clay is brilliant. Clay's, what else you got? Well, I want to tell you about clay. Oh, because one more for the clay. Oh, okay. Abscess is in the mouth if it's handy. Ah. You can get clay and f- make a little parcel out of like a tissue sort of stuff, or mm. gauze better, tissue disintegrates. So you get the gauze and you fill it up with clay, make a little parcel and you put it next to the swollen mm. gum and it draws, draws everything out. out. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Um, the other thing you do with clay is if you wanted to, if you had to drink out of a water hole and, yeah. you, you know, like, you know, it's shitty water, you dig a hole about, you know, two feet away from the thing and let it fill up with water, it draws through the clay yep, and yep. it moves the toxin, you can drink it. Yeah, exactly. So. And so you can, yeah, you get those same clay. There was this very simple process that you can actually get grass into a bit of structure. Yeah. You put that, you make a clay pot and you cook it and then you use that as a filter. You just fill it up with water and all the water that drips out is perfectly you're purified. Awesome. So you can actually make your own filters if you're really stuck out in the bush mm. without water and oh, clean water and a shitload of clay and oh. a little clay oven. Would That's be handy awesome. as well. Well, let's say you're stuck at home and you've got a toothache. Yes. What do you do about that? Ah. Yeah. Well, we, a... we take the codeine, we go to the dentist. Oh, yeah, yeah. Forget that shit. I want to use <laughs> vanilla shit. extract for tooth, toothaches. Yeah, what? what? Vanilla extract for toothaches. Does it work? It does work. I'm glad you asked. Are you serious? Yeah, absolutely. Man, serious. Works. I just got my wisdom tooth ripped out the other day. We had your bloody 43. <laughs> but before yeah. that, I was boiling up. Um, I get cloves. I get a pot yeah. and I fill it up with cloves and caraway seeds mm. and I boil the buggery out of that and yeah. aniseed as well mm. just because I'd like it. Tastes good. Yeah. But you're saying I should have put some vanilla extract a in A little it. bit. Like uh, vanilla beans. Not yeah. But the vanilla is antimicrobial and you just put it on the toothache. It's usually an infection, gingivitis, and it very much helps. And it's it right. good too. Yeah. It's, it's amazing, isn't it? It's just, just like all these home remedies. They're all published in journals and they, they, they find some uh, 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 relief. Another one that, that we, we, we talked about before was about bug bites. But how do you keep mosquitoes off your skin? Um, don't know. And B vitamins. Oh, yeah, B1. But no home remedy. Well, Taking extra I don't B1. Know. Well, you rub good. Vegemite all over yourself. Well, it's, it's pretty good. And they've you know? also got neem and citronellas yep. Yep. and those sort of things. They do work. Yep. So neem trees. But neem's funny because I, I grew a heap of neem trees around where we mm. had all these mosquitoes thinking that, that yeah. they'd just keep away from my yard. It doesn't mm. work. You pretty much got to bash the oil out of it. Yeah. So, you, yeah, you got to get the oil. Can I take you to Texas University now? Texas yeah, A&M University. Yeah. Yeah, they found that's that... That's where Rich is. Exactly. Yeah, Rich. What did he find? Well, Mark Rich found that, that if you uh, put... What's his name? Rich Crider. Rich Crider, that's right. No, he probably didn't do this. He, he probably does didn't find stuff. That. Anyway, carry Dilute on. Dilute bleach actually helps with mosquito bites. What? Relieves the itch. I bet it does. Bleach. <laughs> bleach. Well, Lot bleach on mosquito bites works really well, and that's the research out of the Texas A&M University. That's kind of not... A, would that be good for you? Dilute bleach is fine. Yeah, right. Yeah. What is bleach? Well, bleach is a strong oxidizing agent. No, and when you or something, isn't Sorry? It? What is it? Oh, it's usually uh, hydrogen perchloride. Or it can be um, made from hydrogen peroxide. We talked about H two O two. Yeah, right. But it's usually, uh, you know, a, a chlorine related oxidizer. On my Instagram, I got a good photo of something not to do. Yeah. Because I had a wonderful home remedy for my spider bites. Remember, I got bitten by that spider. That's and right. It, it what ripped, did you do? It put a big hole in my arm, and I was talking about amputating my arm because oh. it started moving, migrating to my armpits. Yeah. So then I panicked and. I thought, oh, I'll do the old hydrogen peroxide to sterilize it. Yeah. But typically they do that with about 3% hydrogen peroxide as yep. a medical emergency. And I had 35% at home. So I put it on. Craziest experience. Didn't really hurt. It was quite weird. It f- bubbled and fizzed mm. like crazy and made like like really hard blisters. And, mm. and it messed it up, hey. And then I pretty much had third degree chemical burns, which yeah. apparently was going to take a long time to heal. But that's when I had some cool stuff to help the healing. Right. And I did all the collagens and mm. all that sort of stuff. But 
man, it sterilized the wound. Oh, yeah. And, but um, that was bad. So probably do 3%. Man, there's YouTube videos on it too that I've seen. I wish I filmed it, eh? Because it was crazy. Just fizzed and bubbled and popped and crackled. And it was kind of like so cool. I just kept doing it. <laughs> and because it didn't hurt. It was like, how could you do so much damage and not be hurt? But then I managed to fix it in about three weeks with all the collagen stuff that we were experimenting because most with. most things are infection from um you know say say if a spider is eating bugs and that they peel up a lot of anaerobes yeah and if you put hydrogen peroxide on it that's strongly aerobic because yeah, it breaks right. down to o2 it's, it's a tiny tiniest spider yeah yeah and and you know if you think peroxide is h2o2 yeah okay so it's got an extra oxygen compared to water and if you take two of those molecules it it turns into h2o yeah and two oxygens or O2, which is yeah. oxygen. That's why you get the bubbles. Yeah. But the oxygen therefore kills the microbes because they're anaerobes, in other words, without air. Yeah, so if yeah. you give them loads of oxygen, yeah. they die. Yeah, right. So that's why you put hydrogen peroxide on wounds. You know, 5%, not 35%, but yeah. yeah, but that sort of thing. <laughs> All right, let's say you've been out fishing, Matt, and you get sunburned. What do you do? You go home? Tomatoes. Yes. Is that what you were going to say? No, but no. that's another Man, good one. I watched this show. There's a show on TV about, yeah. it's like a lion's den like for natural medicine ideas yeah. the dragon's den or what's the den it's a place you know they pitch their ideas to oh yeah the dragon's den and they den. had the doctors that, but this one was for natural natural ideas because oh. they had all the hippie music and then they had the doctors that was a serious yeah. hey I'm a GP yes. <laughs> we will decide anyway, but man one guy come up he's a tomato farmer and he yeah. says all the um, um, workers that come over from the UK and Europe and come and work his tomato things they get smashed they all get really sunburnt and they just smash tomato on themselves and it gets rid of their sunburn. Mm. Takes away the soreness and the redness. Now, tomato is obviously loaded full of lycopene, mm. which we know when you take it internally, it works. But how cool was that? Yeah. They ridiculed him and said, maybe you should try watermelon. Oh. And now I don't, that was genius, hey? I thought it was really good. I love that. There's one doctor on that show, the brain surgeon guy. He's amazing. Oh, I've never seen love that guy. But uh, oh, man, you should see it. Yeah. It's kind of. It's cool, but it's kind of not so cool. It's like almost a bit um, mm. insulting. <laughs> you know? Oh, uh, you know, like this works, you know, if, if they've shown it, you know. In, oh, in yeah, a, what was your story? Aloe I just vera. interrupted. Huh? Aloe vera. Oh, yeah. Aloe. You know, that's a, that's a classic, isn't it? Yeah, it is. And it's been well researched. And in, you're going to get the jelly right in the middle. Yes. Not the slimy stuff yep. immediately beyond the green. And that's simply, basically, it was published in the Journal of the International Society for Burn Injuries. Yeah, right. That's a pretty good journal. I love that yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. And basically it showed that basically it does help. I'm going to try this tomato too. It also, that because it's well, a... Well, polypodium. Pro- my favourite herb for sunburns, polypodium. Yeah. And the way I remember that, it's a herb, a yeah. fern called mm. Calaguala from yep. Guatemala. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's really good for red skin. Uh, and I'm, the thing I like polypodium, it actually worked on the mechanism that burning leads to um, abnormal cells and malignant yeah. cells. So it could actually go through not only just work on the... The redness, and not just to create a barrier, but allows you to have a nice tan and get all the benefits from the sun without actually initiating the oxidative stress and the autoimmune reactions. It's an awesome herb, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, I love polypodium. It's, it's, it's great. really hard to find it in anything. I mean, mm. And the problem is it's not approved as a sun-blocking SPF mm. ingredient. Mm. So if you want to look for a sun-blocking thing with polypodium in it, it's probably called a sun... It's not a sunscreen. I think it's a sun cream. Or something right. they, they just change the words, yeah. you know? Yeah, anyway. Crazy. Crazy. What right. else you got for sunburn? Well, uh, there, that's the only thing I've got for sunburn. Oh, cool. Uh, apart from avoiding the sun. But but let's say you've been to the gym all day and you've worked out and you've got lactic acid in your muscles. Yeah. Epsom salt bath. Oh, yeah? They work really well. Really? Yeah. So what's Epsom salts? That's magnesium uh, carbonate? It's, magnesium? It's, it can be magnesium chloride. Yep. yep. Um, or magnesium, magnesium sulfate. magnesium sulfate? Yeah. yeah that's sulfate's right, we, the most common now, one. Now, Epsom salts yeah. is... Is it a bath for magnesium or is it a bath for sulfates? Yes, great question. Oh, thank you, Steve. It's a great question. Well, well you got a great answer for me? Yeah. Well, well, I still the, don't know. Both, because oh. magnesium works by, you know, relaxing muscles and all that sort yeah, of shit. Yeah. But the sulfate is, is incorporated slightly. It's absorbed a little bit yeah. to help with connective tissue rebuilding. Because the magnesium sulfate molecules, it's not 50-50, is it? It's probably 25% No, no, magnesium there, there's well. one molecule of magnesium to one molecule of SO4 or sulfate. So it is about 50-50. Yeah, yeah. The magnesium is 2 plus yeah, and yeah, SO4 yeah. is two minus so there's oh, yeah, one of yeah, each okay yeah yeah sweet yeah but with chloride there's magnesium and two chlorides but yep. because the chlorides are in a group seven in yep. the periodic table it's got one negative and so citrate we're looking at about 20 percent magnesium so it's one yep. is to five yeah yeah wow and it's very cheap 
Mm. And you know what? It's it helps you relax and all that sort of thing. And it's been used for years, you yeah, know, yeah, as a yeah. as a great way to relieve your, your aching muscles. Yeah. And if you want to make a cream like a magnesium topical cream, you basically just go buy magnesium chloride, chloride. and you can add it to water. That's and awesome, as you dissolve it? it and break it down, it actually feels oily. Yeah. So you can just muck around with your um your percentages. It's pretty crazy, isn't it? I mean, really the the whole the whole thing about the magnesium thing, you know, it works very well with PMS as well. Oh yeah. But magnesium sulfate is not well absorbed. In fact, you give magnesium sulfate before that's, you give a colonoscopy. Yeah, yeah, that's really badly absorbed. It gives <laughs> you the green apple splatters. Why are you telling people to do this? No, I'm not telling people to do that. Uh, but if, if you're going to have a uh, colonoscopy, yeah. like you've turned 50, say, and they recommend yeah. it, I'm not doing it. But um, yeah, they, they give you that so as it gives you the green apple splatters. So they clean yeah. it out so a camera will fit up your rectum. The old scenic your, route. Yeah, scenic route. It goes right up all the way in the colon. It's true. But me, magnesium is also very good for other things too. But what if you what if you got a bad indigestion? Yeah, yes. Yeah. I'll, I'll be sitting up like a monk. <laughs> yes, Why? What right. else should I do? Peppermint oil. What? Are you serious? Peppermint oil is great for it. Really? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Now I I find that funny because I don't mm. think it always works. No. I'm just saying. No, it doesn't always work. No, One thing that peppermint oil I know does is it breaks up gas bubbles. Yeah. Um. Now, Amp V. We have mm. a product called AMV that's based on oils and that mm. sort of stuff. I mean, mm. I, that repeats. I burp a lot with that yeah, because yeah. of the peppermint. So I find the peppermint breaks up the big bubbles and yep. makes them into little bubbles that kind of rumble up. Yeah. And if you've got indigestion there, you know, so for some people that may not work. If you do just have acid in your throat, go mm. get that bicarb you're talking about before. Yeah. yeah Sodium be bicarbonate. Get sodium bicarbonate, half a teaspoon or a teaspoon, a little bit of water. Put that down. It's going to instantly buffer that acid, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. And, and there was a product probably still out there called Quick Ease, which yeah. was peppermint oil with sodium bicarbonate. Yeah, and it's based on calcium magnesium. Mm. So they've got calcium magnesium. It's actually got more calcium in that than a Keltrate tablet yeah. and a better form because you've yeah. also got some magnesium cofactors. But that's interesting. Eh? So yeah. Quick Ease are calcium magnesium bicarb and peppermint oil. Yeah. Yeah, wow. I've got another one for you for your sore muscles, and that's an ice bath. Oh, yeah? yeah. <laughs> if you're brave enough. Yeah, bring it on. It works. Uh, it works really well um, to relieve How? injury because it causes vasoconstriction and stops the inflammatory things, you know, attacking yeah. the tissues. Like putting, you've wounded your, and you put yeah, ice yeah, on yeah, there. Yeah, but this, okay, so, I, so the other day I had a swollen sore foot. Mm. I put ice on it. Mm. It went cold, mm. but it went bright red. Mm. So how does I? How am I shutting down the circulation and getting it red at the same time? Because you're causing micro damage due to ice burns. So, but it goes away pretty much straight away. Oh yeah, look, the, the lymph will clear that out pretty quick, smart. So what? So when we? Because when I make ice, so like if I, this is like when I have frozen fruits and stuff. Yeah. Hey, so if you freeze the fruit, the water inside the cells swells because ice expands it when does. it freezes. It's one of the only thing cold and things. that ruptures the membrane. Yeah. So is it doing that to my blood cells and my micro yeah, Very small liver, yeah, very the, much. Uh, on the surface of the skin. Yeah. And that creates that rubifacient. Yeah, rubifacient was the word? red, yeah. Yeah, rubifacient. Yeah. But the temperature's dropped. There's vasoconstriction. Yeah. So then after I take the ice off, because, you know, with the new studies, as you know, 10 minutes on or mm, 10 minutes mm, off or so, so then... As I take it off, do I then respond with vasodilation because my body's freaking out to think that my limb has disappeared? Up until yesterday, I thought that was the case. Yeah. And I read a physiotherapy page that says, oh, it responds with vasodilation. But then they actually tested it in 1992 and it's not, it what doesn't is, what respond do you mean? with vasodilation. So you put ice on, it shuts yeah. down the blood flow. Yeah. Then it returns to normal once it warms up. And then it, as it warms back to normal. Yeah. So I, just, thought, I, I thought you got reactive. I know, it definitely ice. blocks pain receptors too. Yeah. So one of the most important things with ice is you can use it to immediately switch off the pain response and mm. that will downregulate the degree of inflammation yes. or the degree of inflammatory response. So the fast bowlers, you know, in the Australian team, they have ice baths after their, you know, test match or they're bowling yeah. fast for six, seven hours. Yeah. Because they're working their whole body and they're going nuts like that yeah. for hours. And so it's, it's a great way also reduces the injuries. Well, how is this new cryotherapy? You've seen all this new cryotherapy. Oh, yeah. I mean, this is not a home remedy no, as such. But this one hope, Unless you live in Antarctica yeah. or something, but... The cryotherapy, how does that work for detoxes and things? What is it doing? Well, cryo means temperature and, and change. Well, so, no, these people are getting in these freezing cold chambers and just the outside, their, their peripheral parts of their body are just getting blasted for a mm. short period of time, like really, really cold. Are we, 
Hey, is it maybe swelling up fat cells or something? Could it blow up the fat cells water? Well, or? well, we know that cryotherapy is used as a liposuction treatment where they, they freeze the fat cells, the fat cells die, and then they get circulated. It kills about 25% of them every time you have a treatment. Yeah, well, so if you had a, a blob of fat here and you wanted to get rid of it, yeah, yes, yeah. you can get it sucked off and ends up with you. But you can get cryotherapy on it, which freezes the fat, and yeah. about 25% of the, the percent of this fat cells die off. Huh. And that, that's a that's a medical treatment you can go to you know they're on the Gold yeah. Coast or everywhere so that that's a treatment for that but getting into an ice bath cryotherapy does increase blood pressure because your body reacts constricts with it. the peripheral blood vessels and therefore you've blood you've, pressure you've goes reduced up. your pi- piping by half yeah and your blood hasn't reduced yeah so the amount of blood that's in the other pipes then has increased yeah. Wow. And so, so it does cause a, 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 you know, in, in you know, Scandinavian countries, I don't know the health benefits of this improved circulation where they go really cold and really hot, really cold. Really yeah, hot. yeah, yeah, yeah. That so that's just to get the blood vessels just freaking out. Freaking out. So, yeah. and that would increase circulation, which circulation helps move toxins, like we are talking about circulation in the brain yeah. before. So it works, works out really, so really well. So if with my injuries, should we go hot, cold, hot, cold as well? Well, that was actually a treatment, but they say now cold for the first 24 to 40 hours and then, then the recovery. Flush, cold, cold, you, got, cold. Got to, you don't want to encourage the inflammatory response. You want yeah. to cover the healing response, which is 24 to 48 hours later. Hmm. Interesting, eh? And that's very a, interesting. That's a home remedy there. Um, it is. What, what about if you've you know, got a hangover? What do you do oh. as a home remedy? Whinge a lot. I'm around, I go back to bed. <laughs> what about coconut water and bananas? Oh, you could probably do that. It's the re- replenishes I'll be all that for potassium. bacon typically. And my theory is it's soaking up my bile. Soaking up your bile. So I've made all this extra bile. I've got a tummy yeah. full of bile. It makes me feel lousy. Mm. So I'm going to put some stuff in to soak up that bile, which typically for me would be fat. Yep. But you're saying I should have a watermelon and coconut. That sounds like some well, of the things bananas that I've drunk coconut with water. the night before. <laughs> I, I, pina I'm a coladas. kind of guy. Think, think, think of pina coladas. It's like the pineapple coconut. But and it, sex on the is, beach. Yep, and um, getting caught in the rain. Yeah. You know, all those sorts of things. like a perfect match, dude. Yeah, absolutely. You should put an ad in the newspaper. God. <laughs> uh, 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 That's such a dodgy song. I only just realised what that song was about. Oh, it's about, it's terrible. I that played was terrible. It's his two husband and wife that yeah. were trying to sneak off cheating. Yeah. They probably had been because she was being in the paper already when yes. he found her. yes. Like, oh, my gosh. And then they go for this date and they're like, oh, it was you, you, you. <laughs> We're so good for each other. We're both We're pirates. both cheating assholes, yeah. Isn't that... It's terrible. I thought that, was, that... I had no idea that's what that song was about. Oh, it is. It's got the three verses where he goes through, he puts his ad in the paper and then he tells him what he says and you feel like Pina Colada's getting caught in the rain, blah, blah. Yeah. And then, you know, he thought the poem wasn't so bad and then he... In the real world, it'd be like, you fucking lie. You hate yeah. that shit. Not once have you taken <laughs> me for Pina Coladas in the rain <laughs> on the beach, shagging. And you say you love oh, that shit. You've been making Liar. love after midnight. Oh, jeez. Who you been doing that with, Steve? Well, no one. I'm now going to bed at 9 o'clock and I go to sleep at 9 o'clock. I don't do anything it's after amazing. 9 o'clock. Yeah. Imagine, lucky you don't go for a toilet at nine o'clock. Oh, you got a toilet about <laughs> one o'clock. About Tie your head to the wall. But I, but I, well, you, 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 know, you know that. Cross your legs. <laughs> they tie their head to the wall. I, I love that picture. That was hilarious. Um, all right. What if you've got acne and you got a, you want a home remedy for acne? No. Oh, you don't want that? Oh, we're aware of that one. Yeah, let's do it. Bring it on. All right. Apple cider vinegar. Why? Apples, because the low pH oh. destroys the yeah. propionyl bacterium acne. Oh. Yeah. I think it's, you know, but apple cider vinegar is one other thing. Like, it's a home remedy for anything. I never forget what. It pretty once. much is. There's lots of things. I had gout it? once, a real bad case of gout, and Ooh. it was almost fixed. Yeah. And then the wife goes, man, this is apple cider vinegar thing. Now, there's these things. You know, I, I study stuff and I typically research yeah, and I look into things. Hmm. But sometimes it's easier just to do what the wife says, just to shut her up. <laughs> I knew it was going to be a bad idea. I was almost on top of this. I'd had a strategy. I'd fix this thing. This did yeah. not make sense to me. But yeah. just for the sake of not having to listen yeah. to this bullshit about an apple, putting my foot in apple cider vinegar, I just went and did it. Man, it blew up like you would <laughs> not believe. It was the worst thing I could have ever possibly done. And it took them out a month to recover after it. God. So foot baths, apple cider vinegar for gout is no. No, definitely. But I'll tell you what a But on cider- acne... Yeah. It'll sterilize it. Just sterilizes it. Low tea right. tree oil. Tea tree oil has been shown to work too. That's a good home remedy for the acne thing too. Um, if you want to bathe your feet in something if they smell, you can use either an acid or an alkaline. So normal uh, vinegar, which is acetic acid or apple cider vinegar, but vinegar is cheaper, hmm. drops the pH to about three. 
kills microbes. Oh, or yeah. you can put it in baking soda, the one we use that the thing, and that raises the pH to about 10, kills microbes. Yeah, right. Crystals so, don't work. I know that. Crystals. No, crystals don't work. And mm. I've got proof of that by people that use crystals yeah. for underarm deodorant. And oh, they stink, yeah. man. Seriously, stink. And you're sitting there going, and you, you just as a, not just so much a home remedy tip, mm. but just a life hack. If someone suggests you try deodorant, just use it. <laughs> it's a polite way of someone saying you stink. Yeah. Now, don't sit there and go, oh, no, I use crystals. They really work, you know. It's like, no, they don't. You stink. Use something different. Crystals don't work for deodorant. No, for, mm. They don't. They stink. Everyone mm. I know that rubs a rock under their arm every day stinks like they've been rubbing rocks under their arm <laughs> expecting it to be a deodorant. They don't work, Steve. They don't. When, when I used to make deodorants, we used oh, to Oh, here we go. You knew all <laughs> along. <laughs> well, we, we used to put aluminum chlorohydrate, 10%, in yeah. our deodorants. So, so, yeah, it smells good. We put the smelly stuff in there. But the aluminum chlorohydrate dehydrates the skin, so microbes need mi- uh, moisture yeah. to grow. But yeah. also, aluminum is toxic yeah. for microbes. Yeah, and humans and everyone uh, yeah. else and that. So, so one of the worst things you can do is put deodorant on with the aluminum chlorohydrate and breathe at the same time. Well, that's a bad idea. You just... So if you're going to use this stuff on your arms, <gasps> hold your breath. That's a home remedy to stop aluminium because it's not absorbed through the skin, but it's absorbed through the Wasn't lungs. your job at one stage smelling the deodorants? Yep. Quality Absolutely. control guy. You had to spray it in and sniff it. We used to get that. The, the, we, we used to, no, we used to, we used to tip like that and, shh, and then just sniff like that. And what we'd also, I guess what else we had to do, even what? worse, we had to we'd measure how much was coming out of the nozzle. And yeah. it had to be a certain amount. The only way you can measure that is weigh the can beforehand. Oh, it's 200 grams. And you hold it in the room like that for about two minutes. Yeah. And then you weigh it again, see how much came out in two minutes. Yeah, right. Two minutes of spraying like that. And you're just sitting there. Oh, yeah. How's your day? Yeah, good. Yeah. Yeah, you drink beer last night. Yep, sure. And it's spraying for two minutes. You're breathing. And that's everything. messed up. Well, it was a messed up job. Hey, in my clinic too. Yeah. One of the first things that we know, I used to have the women come in with the breast lumps and, oh, yeah. and that sort of lymph nodey stuff under the arms. Yeah. First thing I ever did is I tell them, get off the aluminium deodorants yes. and stop wearing underwire bras. Oh, yeah, Man, yeah. Used to, 80% of the time, well, maybe not, I just made that number up, but a lot, <laughs> it disappeared. And then the next strategy I used to do was Lugol's solution on the soles of the feet yes. to fix an iodine um, deficiency. Mm. Quickly load up iodine, get rid of the aluminium and get rid of the underwire bras. Most of the lumps and bumps disappeared. Very interesting you say that because the... The rest were cancer. Oh, okay. No, I don't know. But no, the, no. You know, you, that, you, that's like the reality. You still send them off for the the um, the scans and make yeah. sure it's nothing sinister. But try those couple of things. If they disappear Sorry. and they find that it's not something sinister, yeah. then that was lucky. Now, of course, you can use betadine too. That's potassium iodide, 10%. Oh, yeah. Yep. And that can, that can that, that's what you use to... Or you can use Condi's crystals. Condi's crystals, yeah, very make good. Make your ducks go purple. Um, another really interesting one that we, we used to talk about in, in the olden days, again, were, were treatments that involved um, um, like uh, skin brushing and those sorts oh, of things yeah, yeah. to increase circulation. Yeah. It does increase circulation. Yeah, yeah, of course. But, but it's sort of like... Uh, so, so, I mean, do you think there's still value in that? Yep. Yeah. I reckon, and the key is though that the lymphatics to yep. support the lymphatics, you brush in the direction back to your heart, back to your heart because yeah. your, your blood's going to go that way anyway. Mm. You've got a heart pushing it that way. Mm. Your lymphatics need a little bit of help, so mm. you go back up that way. Something I thought was really cool, and I'm starting to see it out now, is fascia scraping. There was also oh. another thing used by the Spartans and that sort of stuff where they'd oil up and then use like a, a knife or a blade and they'd actually scrape. So you'd actually go through, you'd cover yourself in oil yeah. to absorb the toxins you yeah. had to yeah. d- dilute it, and then you'd scrape it off and throw it away. And that was another way that they'd clean when you couldn't have baths. Yeah. But the benefits of fascia scraping and moving those lymphatics is yeah. phenomenal, man. Yeah. There'd be more muscle recovery and lymphatic recovery from that than cleanliness. But man, that was amazing. And speaking of kids, even clean in deodorants and underwire bras. Avoid uh, John the Spartan. <laughs> yes, John the Spartan. <laughs> there is there is a chemical reason why that causes lumps and bumps is because when you get two different metals together, yeah. there's a thing called electrolysis that occurs, which yeah. is the transfer of an electric current. So, for example, if you ever look at a battery, it's got two types of metal. Yeah, in, yeah. You know, and it's and so that causes an electric current, which can cause um, you know electromagnetic yeah. radiation and cancers. And in the fishing boats, people get their tackle stuck yep. under their ribs there. 
That sounded weird. That's don't go fishing with John and you, yeah, you, you tackle yeah. under your ribs. No. But if you get like a hook or something stuck under the rib of the boat, yeah. the electrolysis from driving will actually put holes through your boat. So most people that get holes in their boats is just from weird electrolysis. Yeah, stuff. and you see the on the back of boats they have these sacrificial electrodes. Have you seen those? Yeah, They're yeah. Usually aluminium. Yeah, yeah. And that the, the mixing metal then just eats that away. That's cool, eh? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. So that's electrolysis. So if you have different metals in your mouth, for example, yeah. it's the perfect magnetic, it, it, it causes an electric current. Yeah, wow, well, man. Because you've got, like, like in the olden days when we used to make um, batteries, and, and this is what you do in science class, you get a lemon that's yeah. got electrolytes and everything, you stick a copper plate in one side, zinc in the other, and you can, you can measure the voltage difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So imagine that in your mouth. No. Or underwire bra, underwire, yeah. and aluminium. Yeah, wow. Well. It's not, you know, so, huh. yeah, it's a little bit nerdy. I don't want to go there too. No, I like it. That was oh, nice. okay, we well, yeah. like it. So, so that's good. It, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so what about fungus in your toes? What? Yeah. Uh, who's been talking to you? What do you know about <laughs> fungus in my toes? <laughs> <He's been telling laughs> you. Tea tree oil. Good old tea tree oil. Really? Does it work? Yep. Works beautifully. It's true. It, yep. How do you get it there? Tea tree oil. You just rub it in, in yeah, your toenail. Into the toenail? Yeah, and you, you, you get... You rub it on the toenail? You, Does you it go rub, through the toenail? You, no, you, 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 you get it on your finger and you push it and rub it under the toenail, draw it back. What the hell? How, what like, are, you, are your toenails like a bridge? Yeah. How, what do you, you know, it don't your toenails sit to a nail bed? No, no, but then you draw it back like that over the nail bed. I hope people are watching this. But you draw it back over the nail bed and it gets stuck under the nail. This is the end. So these people have that... You know, I'm talking when they got it like... Yeah, they got the... Yeah. Stop looking at my feet. Oh, I don't have it. That was a joke at the start. But yeah, like it's normally like under the whole nail. Like it's it's like oh, yeah. um This this helps. This helps, but you know, again yeah, you shouldn't scrape it out and like really fill it up or put some Ooh. holes in it and Yeah, you could I guess. Yeah. Oh, good. Yeah. But oh, that I that serious, that would make me very anxious, <laughs> and the only way to get rid of anxiety is, oh, chamomile, well, is the chamomile tea. Segue. Oh bullshit! It's not the only way. <laughs> no, but the chamomile tea has been shown to be great for for anxiety. If you've got that sort of, you know, you're getting a bit stressed around the house, you're going through mm. a rough period at work. A good old, old remedy is is really good yeah, for, for that boring. sort of thing. Boring, boring. Eh? A lot of people have chamomile tea. I yeah. can't stand chamomile tea. Have we have we talked about uh, urinary tract infections? Uh, not today. Not today. Well, cranberry juice is good for that. <laughs> Now, now, you and I probably oh. know that quite regularly because yes, of the, I know it, because of the acidic component in the cranberry is what stops the binding from the bacteria to the bladder wall. I think it's hypocritical. So were but you I can't about remember. to say it was a um, urinary alkalizer, Steve? Yes, probably. No, I wasn't going to say alkalizer because it's hypocritic acid which causes the. the but man, that's what a lot of people think. You got to have cranberry because it's a urinary alkalizer. Oh. But then it's got the acid. It's got an acid component. It's yeah. actually an acid in it that does it. And it gets all the way through the urine and stops bacteria binding. It's also really good for stomach ulcers, stops Helicobacter pylori binding. Oh, yeah. It's also really good for breaking up biofilm through all your intestinal stuff and effective against candidas yep. and that sort of stuff. So cranberry is absolutely excellent, but Isn't not that? because it's an alkalizer. Yeah, that's so awesome. You can use it with an alkalizer like Ural, but don't think you're... A lot of, have you seen a lot of them combine them? They got that cranberry Ural. That's oh, cool, alkalizer. really? Yeah. So Jeez. it's not that. I think the alkaline urinizers, don't they have like a carbonate in there, like a sodium bicarbonate or yeah, something? Yeah, usually or citrates and that sort of stuff mm, as well. Okay. So. All right. So let's say you've got high blood pressure. Um, what about parsley leaves? That's oh, a yeah. natural diuretic. Oh, yeah. 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 Because one of the medications for blood pressure, there's four main classes, but one is a diuretic. Yeah, it's cool. Cool. Just be careful if you're already on blood pressure medication because yeah. you'll be told to avoid potassium. And this yeah. is what bugs me, all the natural stuff we do. For, to prevent veggie. these things, they're full of potassium. All your veggies are full of potassium. Yeah. All your nutrients, it's so high potassium in a good, healthy fruit and veg diet. And then they get put on potassium sparing diuretics mm. and told they can't touch potassium foods. Yeah. It's just like, man, so freaky. So before you get to that position, using things like parsley, yeah. rosemaries, asparagus, mm. cranberries, yeah. um, dandelion leaf. Yes. So when you look at dandelion, it's a dandelion leaf, not the mm. root that does the diuretic aspects, and the yep. root does the liver. That's yeah. a cool one. It's, it's a pretty cool one, eh? And I know, yep. look, we're, we're... Corn silk for urinary tract infections yeah, is one that's of my favourite cool. home remedies yeah. because, so corn silk, so the stringy bits in your corn cobs, mm. that stuff is magic. It works really, really fast too. Mm. And you can just chew on it or you can make it into a cup of tea or you can throw it in your chicken soup. Yeah. And one of the great herbs that when I remember learning about it was hawthorn. Yeah. Crataegus oxycanthalus yeah, yeah. for, the, for the heart. And there's parts of Australia where they can just go and haw harvest them hawthorn berries and that, aren't you? Steal it from a crop. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. But no, there's, I'm not, yeah, because 
these home remedy things are, are tricky, you know. Like I, mm. I grow a fair bit of stuff at home, so we try to grow lots of different stuff. So we've got like a first aid kit at home um, in case we don't already have it in the cupboard. But if you come to my house and you open up the cupboard, it's like going into a Asian and Indian grocery oh, store. It's which awesome. All the layers of all the – and it smells like it too, all the – the herbs and spices and everything that we have in bulk and in the raw forms. Wow. Yeah. It's just, I, I love nature has all this sort of stuff. It's it's absolutely fantastic. Probably, we, we've been going for an hour 20. We have to probably probably last yeah, yeah, one. Yeah, I think yeah, we're getting a bit close. But but this one's plantain and, and plantain is a really good one for, for your skin, a yeah. nourishing thing for your skin. Yeah. So if you just want a general one that's, you're not sick or anything, you just want a, your skin to look better, plantain yeah. leaves is a terrific one to incorporate in your diet as a What's wellness um, So So it's like that good old doctor in a signatures so and i'm sorry for the people who are watching here and that sort of thing i'm looking at the leaf and you can imagine a leaf it looks like skin with veins going through it oh, yeah. the only way you can describe it i mean yeah, like a again, scrotum or something doesn't it? it looks like exactly like my scrotum look at that look at it it's the same hang color on, hang on. brooklyn does that look like <laughs> same color green and <laughs> green withered. And, green and withered yeah yeah so weird gray uh, fluffy stuff sticking out from it Yep, that looks in those little Ugh. twiggy, little tiny skinny yeah, things coming out of it. Looks exactly out of like, yeah, it. looks looks identical. Ah. <laughs> so plantain is great for your skin if you want better health and that sort of thing for your skin. All right, all right. But, uh, so we are. Uh, that's a couple of good home remedies that, that we've we've. Uh, well, that's all we have got time for. Um, so thanks everybody for listening. Yeah, thanks, Steve. No, it's my pleasure to be here. I love I love these podcasts. This is good stuff. Oh, you big dog. It's yeah, cool, absolutely. eh? All, All right. right. Have a great day, guys. Bye. All right. <laughs>